Uh, we introduced each other yesterday, so I hope you are ready because it's going to be a quite intense day. I think this is a bit too strong. Let's move it down. Yeah, no, it's reverse less. And what are we going to be covering today? Well, I'm going to do my best and I have to tell you that I am a bit dangerous because once I start talking, I don't shut up. So if at some point it's too much, please raise your hand, ask about anything that might not be too clear because the point is for you to get quite a few fundamentals. And what we are going to be covering today is all the path from the main general idea, the main principle that kind of powers all those large scale, some of those big data processing systems to what's in general parallel computing, then how can we do parallel computing in different ways, I will be very brief here, then what's actually that interesting about big data, why did everyone suddenly start talking about big data six years from now and what are the main things that make those big data systems potentially interesting for a lot of people and with that we will cover a half of our lecture. We will do a um, coffee break, we have coffee in the other room in this same floor and then in the second part I am going to introduce one specific big data processing platform, Apache Spark, which has become extremely popular over the last two, three years. It was not the first big data system to appear. I will speak briefly of MapReduce and Hadoop, which was really the forefront that started all this interest about big data, but for practical purposes, it is more usable, it is relevant in more scenarios than those initial systems and that's why I have chosen it as the actual practical platform that we will be basing both today and tomorrow's lab. So let's start then and again, I want to start from the general top idea and at the end of the day, everything that we are doing when we use a big data system is to actually run some jobs in a parallel computing platform. So then, so that all of us are in the same page. What's parallel computing? Well, it's a self-descriptive name. It is the idea of using multiple processors, multiple CPUs, all of them at the same time together for solving one problem. And actually that's something that these days is really commonplace because all of our devices, not only our computers but our mobile phones, tablets, everything has moved to a multi-core scheme in which rather than having increasingly faster processors, we have more of them and the idea is that we can squeeze more computing power by running all of the tasks split among the different processors. So then if, I, if in order to complete my algorithm I need to run 100 steps and I have 10 processors, ideally I will just assign 10 tasks to each one of my processors and I will finish 10 times quicker. That's not how reality works sadly because parallelizing those problems is actually pretty hard and the main thing that all those parallel computing schemes uh, rely on and make them interesting is that we need to figure out some ways of coordinating how all those different parts are working. But this is something that we anyway have to do because um, I don't think I need to convince you of this. When we are doing research on some fields, we are handling many times very large data sets. We are processing gigabytes of information, we might be getting to process terabytes of information, we are running some complex computations and sooner or later we are going to stumble with two bottlenecks. Either what we try to do is too large to actually fit on a single machine and for that graphs are actually very relevant. Ideally, if you want to do some graph analysis, you would want to load your whole graph information in memory. If your graph has one million nodes, it's probably going to be okay. On a powerful machine, you can load that and then use 
Python, R, whichever MATLAB, whichever processing platform you like. However, if your graph has one billion nodes, good luck. There is not a single machine that can host, that can hold all that information. And then we need to figure out how to take that graph, split it on different elements, on different machines, and find a way to put all those machines to work together. Another related uh, task is when some of those computations take too long. And probably many of you are having using simulations, possibly machine learning techniques, and maybe it takes a whole day or a whole week to get the result of something you are actually computing. Well, if rather than taking a week, you could take an hour to complete some analysis, that could substantially change, actually, how can you approach a problem. Um, those two things have basically pushed almost every type of problem, every type of program, to a parallel computing scheme. And again, the problem that we find is that even if we are pushed to do running all our programs in parallel, this is something that is not exactly intuitive, is not exactly simple. Because all of us, regardless of our experience in programming, we are always used to the nice sequential programming style. And that is the same scheme regardless of whether we are writing programs in base C, Java, Python, MATLAB, to some extent. We just define one instruction at a time. First we do this, then we do that, then we do that, until we finish to the end. If we have many elements, we define a loop and we go element by element to our loop until we are done computing. However, the moment we are actually running multiple threads, multiple processors in parallel, we no longer can design our problems as a single thread. We need to figure out how can we take all the whole tasks that we need to complete for our algorithm and how to allocate them to different processors. And in many cases, it's not only a problem of dividing those tasks, but it's also a problem on how can we manage to synchronize the state of all those different processors. Because if my algorithm, imagine that you have a simple algorithm that has five steps. First I do this, then I do that, then I do that, fourth step, fifth step. Well, you cannot start the final part of your computation until you have finished all the previous ones. And then that means that you cannot simply take each one of those blocks and run it in parallel in a different machine. We will need to figure out ways to possibly take each one of those steps and whatever computations we need to compute them, spread them as much as possible among many machines. And Usually, we will see when we go to big data systems some more specific ways in how we are doing that. But one of the most common or intuitive ways of doing that is by taking one large input data, taking one list of elements, collection of elements, and what we can do in many cases is to split partition that list of elements among many machines and then ask each of them to process a different chunk. And that has been the main naive approach by which parallel computing uh, programming languages have been designed. In the history of parallel computing, there are two main ways by which we can achieve that. There are shared memory languages and message passing languages. And they are actually very different in how they view all of our information. In the case of shared memory systems, we have basically the same view, the same information shared among all the processors in our system. So imagine that all of you are actually uh, processors in a parallel computing environment, and all of you need to do the same task. Maybe we have here one pile of books and we need to find something among all those books. Well, if this is a shared memory setting, all the books will be there. And 
each of you can actually go and pick up any of the books. There is no restriction, no separation of, no concept of belonging of that information among all of you. That requires definitely some coordination because we have many dangers in actually do it, trying to do the same thing at the same time well, not the same thing, but trying to do at the same time conflicting things on the same element of the same memory space. If I want to read something and at the same time somebody is writing on that, we run into what is called as consistency problems. Depending on who gets there first, maybe I read some obsolete information or maybe someone is writing and then I cannot get to that element and I need to wait until that element is actually available. So it can be a bit tricky to figure out a clean way of separating space. However, if we have something like a matrix of elements and we want to do some transformation that can be neatly applied to each sub-matrix, to each subspace of that, possibly we can say you work on the bottom left pile of elements, you work on the bottom right, top right, left right, and by doing that you can coordinate very effectively. This is the type of parallel computing that takes place in usually inside a single machine. So you can run that when you are writing any program using threads in your in any standard programming language and that's also the basis for GPU based programming with standards such as uh, OpenMP or CUDA and basically what they tend to do in those type of languages is say okay this is the function that I'm going to apply into a list of elements and I will tell it I want to use 16 cores for running this function and those languages are specialized in splitting my data into as many parts and then running that independently in each one of those elements. If the actual hardware resources that you have are powerful enough and your computation is very regular, you in general have to do the same operation multiple times, those type of systems definitely can work well and that's why CUDA systems have become very popular and GPU computing. The other scheme, which is much more flexible, is what is known as message passing. And the idea of message passing is that we no longer have everything here, all of you in the same room. Basically, each one of the processors has its own independent space, its own memory address space, its own computing resources, and in order to complete the task, what we need to do is to coordinate a set of independent elements by basically sending messages among them. So then, imagine that then each one of you would be in a different office, all of you are working independently, and when you find something, then you send a letter, basically, to another processor so that they can check that, they can cross-check that element. So, we no longer have to figure out how to split the information because we are already in a kind of an independent space. What we need to figure out is what is many times known as the choreography. When is my time to send information? When should I be waiting for people to give me tasks that then I'm going to be using? So, basically we have those two schemes. Either in shared memory, everyone has basically access to the same information, but then we need to be careful in controlling that not at any point there are no two threads that try to access the same information at the same time. And again, that can go work well in a single machine. The other alternative approach is we have a network. We have a set of nodes and we are going to put all those nodes to work together and whenever I need to do any kind of coordination because the full data set, the full information is partitioned across all those machines. Whenever I want to do that I will make sure that this element sends a message possibly to this other machine and then this machine 
in its own program code needs to be waiting to receive a message from this other element. So because of that, and well, again, for kind of historical reasons, the main language that was used in mostly in scientific fields for large-scale computer simulations, for physics, the main programming language that was using this scheme was called the MPI and the set of MPI directives, which was basically a set of extensions for C or for other languages that implemented this type of primitives. So that we write the same code for every element, but we need to say when this element is going to be sending information and who is sending information to. This one needs to tell when it's waiting to receive information from others. And that actually caused that until the last 10 years, shared memory programming was considered to be much more simple than message passing. <coughs> because, yes, here we need to coordinate so that we don't try to consume the same information. But here we need to be much more explicit. We need to all the time say, I'm sending this to you. And at the same time, you need to say, I am waiting to receive this from me. So this actually was much more strange and much more different to how we would be doing an algorithm. On the other hand, the advantage of message passing is that it is a much more flexible model because here we actually have a very strong requirement. We basically assume that all of my processors, all my elements have fast and homogeneous access to the same memory, to the same fields of information, which in many cases means that all of those processors are collocated in the same machine. But again, as we need to process increasingly larger and bigger problems, there might, might not be a machine powerful enough to actually fit the problem. And then we would actually have to go to a distributed system and a message passing style of it. So this has traditionally been more difficult to implement, but it did scale up to larger sizes, up to more complex elements. Okay. So that's what uh, parallel computing has been over the last uh, 40 years, 50 years, with those two different elements coming. And all this uh, balance has kind of shifted because this idea of big data suddenly came out of nowhere. Um, I was checking yesterday some Google Trends with some definitely related elements. And here you have OpenMP. This is the open source language for shared memory programming. OpenMPI, again, the message passing one. And you can see that they've been kind of stable over the years. But there is big data, this meaningless buzzword by now, which started being relatively unimportant and then has become something that every company is talking about and wants now. So if we actually look at some other terms that might have some relationship to that. I also look for CUDA, the language for NVIDIA cards for doing GPU programming, which has been consistently popular over this time. But the term that kind of correlates with this explosion of big data is Hadoop, that you can see here, this red line. And what is Hadoop? Hadoop is an open source project. It's a system implemented in Java and released in Apache that took one paper published by Google in 2008 and basically released an implementation of that that everyone could use. So Hadoop really has been the buzzword that everyone is talking, but the real ideas behind these big data systems come from a paper released by Google in 2008 that basically explains how was Google at that point, likely four years before that point, because they only publish those papers once they have found the next generation system that is going to be better suited for their needs. But they decided to share 
when you are Google and you have to basically process the whole internet, how can you actually get to those elements fast? And the answer they found was a system called MapReduce. And they actually had a quite good definition of what this MapReduce system is. It's a simple and powerful interface that enables automatic parallelization and distribution of large-scale computation combined with an implementation that achieves high performance on large clusters of commodity PCs. It's a kind of a complex definition, but basically what they say is that MapReduce is a combination of two things. On one hand you have a powerful interface, and by interface they mean a programming abstraction or a programming model that is supposed to be simple and the revolutionary thing of this programming interface is that it comes bundled with an implementation with a system that can automatically take the code that we write and run it with no modification on a large cluster of commodity PCs. That kind of means the idea behind MapReduce is that it proposes a programming model that does not look, it, it can work in parallel, but it does not look like a parallel programming model. It does not look like anything we've seen before, those shared memory message passing elements, but it comes bundled with a set of frameworks, a set of installed elements in my cluster that understand that and automatically take my small pieces of code and schedule a cluster of thousands of machines to run that and get the results that we want. Where does this idea come from? Also to give a little bit of background. Well, what Google kind of did is taking one extremely influential idea that was published in the 90s by Leslie Valiant. And it was this idea of a bulk synchronous parallel model. I was mentioning before that one of the main problems of those message passing schemes is that we need to figure out how to coordinate us. When I am going to send information, when I need to wait to receive, and to figure that for every single computer, for every single processor. And Leslie Valiant proposed basically a very straightforward, homogeneous model for coordinating a cluster, in which he said, well, the right way, the sensible way of coordinating a huge set of processors by sending messages is by basically splitting all the computation into two parts. On one part, you take each one of the processors and you compute everything independently in parallel, not bothering about what's going on with the others. And at the end of each one of those computations, you allow any processor to send messages to any of the other processors. All those messages are sent and once everyone has finished sending and receiving messages, you can start a new stage of your computation. It's a simple model, but that's actually what it's a good idea. Because rather than trying to find very complex uh, optimized schemes in which you have each one of the processors, each one of the elements doing something different, it's going to be much easier to figure out good ways to process data if we actually find a much more stable concept like that one. And this is basically what Google did. If I'll go back to the previous slide soon, but what MapReduce did is, look, if you want to process some input data, it doesn't matter how big, how large that input data is, you only need to write two functions. One function is called map, the other function is called reduce. And if you give basically those two functions to a map reduce cluster, what map reduce does is automatically creates all this execution workflow. It takes the input data, splits this input data into as many sub chunks as needed, and it processes each one of those chunks in parallel with the first function. 
Then it does some magic that it is not written here, but it basically groups together all the intermediate results. So that all the results belonging to the same element are put together. And then for each group of elements, it runs this second function that you define, this reduce function. Once you have those two, once you have this reduce function running parallel, you finally have the actual answer to your system. If we want to see an example in how that works, I can use the by far most overused program ever. Whenever you see any type of reference about big data, Hadoop, MapReduce, there is a 90% chance that they will teach you how to count words from a text. Which is not the most exciting use case ever, but MapReduce is very good at counting words. And that is something that Google was interested, because what they were doing was to collect all the, web, all the actual text from all the pages from the web. So it kind of makes sense. So what do we want to do here? We have some input data. And our input data, it could be one page of text, one megabyte of text, or it could be terabytes and terabytes of text. Billions and billions of words. It doesn't matter for MapReduce. And what I want to do with all that information is to count how many times each one of those words appears in the text. So maybe the word big appears 788,000 times. So all of us would know how to do that by writing a sequential program. We basically split this into words, then go word by word, and we basically if the word already existed, we increment it by one, kind of. If it's a new one, we just say there is a new word on my list and I've seen it one time. That would kind of be the naive implementation. Well, what MapReduce allows us to do is to write two functions that look... This is not exact uh, MapReduce code, but I try to make it a bit more uh, compressed one map function and one reduce function. And the, again, the kind of revolutionary thing of the idea of this big data framework is that if you see what I am doing here in map, in map, I take as input one line of text, I split that line into words, so I check the spaces and I get a list with all the individual words, and for each one of the words, I generate one partial result. I generate a key with the actual word, and then a partial count. I have seen the word big once. And I do that for each line of my text. The second function, this reduce function, has a different input. It has as a string one word, and it has as a value all the single values that have been emitted for that word. That means that if when running map I have found one million times the word V, I will have here one million values. It's one of them with a count of one. And what I do here is to count all those partial values together and then emit the final result that I have. So, do not worry too much about the syntax because we are not going to be learning MapReduce, but Spark. What I want you to see here is that there is no mention at all of parallel computing, of message passing, on how to split our data here. This kind of looks like some code that could be run on a single machine. The cool thing here is that when you send something like that to a MapReduce cluster, the computation is so structured, so constrained, that the, cl the actual cluster knows how to take this map function and basically run it in many different machines in parallel. It's going to take my initial input, all this collection of texts, 
split it into lines and for each one of those lines run the map function then automatically without us doing anything it's gonna take all the partial results all those words with a count of one and it's gonna shuffle them together and group them together in different machines and for each one of those collections again it's going to run this reduce function this second reduce function so that we get one single value per element and if we are actually developers if we are people who are wanting to use this system the nice thing is that we have actually managed to do a very clean separation when actually having to implement a parallel computing program the idea is that we only need to, bother, to worry about this we only need to worry about what we want to do and if we understand what is a map and what is a reduce we will simply implement there the two functions that we are going to process and the same two functions are going to work no matter how large my data set is I am going to rely on the system that is installed in the cluster to perform all the parallelization that is actually involved here and if you remember what I was telling you before I was saying that there are too many two different ways of doing parallel computing we have shared memory everything is in the same place and we just need to coordinate so that we don't step on each other and message passing information is distributed and we need to communicate by sending messages from one to the other what which of those two paradigms is the one you can see here shared memory or message passing Anyone? I have one shared memory. Let's try to do hands, which might be easier. Who thinks it's shared memory? One. Who thinks it's message passing? Okay, a few more message passing. Yes, this is a message passing system because it's one of those map and reduce uh, boxes that you can see here it's a different machine in the network this is going to be a cluster and what is going to happen is that the input data that we have here is going to first of all be partitioned and is going to be assigned to each one of those mappers and actually what happens here between mapping and reducing is that there is going to be lots of messages taking place in my system because basically all the results that have been generated here for each one of the mappers are going to be sent are going to travel to be grouped together to the same machine that is going to reduce all of them which basically means that my mapper is going to send all the results split to all the nodes that are going to be working as reducers the very good thing especially when you compare this with MPI is that I don't have to code any of those messages and I am going to hope I am going to think that whoever implemented the framework is actually going to do all those tasks efficiently and if they don't do that efficiently that is great news for distributed system researchers because making this work is actually very challenging there are lots of problems that we can actually work to try to make this type of systems as efficient as possible and that's why we keep publishing more and more papers that look in how to optimize this communication how to estimate how many mappers or how many tasks we are needing here because the ultimate goal is for people to only worry about what they want to do and get all the difficult bits of parallel programming left to whoever invented the framework ok, 
Okay, so, well, this is just a small note. How many of you have ever worked with a functional programming language? Just out of curiosity. Could be Haskell, Scala, anything that has to do with lists. Okay, only one and a half. Well, just as an anecdote, this is not really required for you to understand how to use those systems, but it can actually help a bit. Another, I was mentioning this BSP model as a big inspiration for MapReduce. The other big inspiration with how those systems are designed comes actually from functional programming languages, which are a different way of defining how we actually express our programs. It is a more mathematical way of saying, because we kind of express the operations we want to do rather than having to go into the step of things. And in particular, a nice thing of functional programming languages is that they allow us to use actual functions as elements of the language. And here you can see two examples. One is the extremely common map function that takes a list of elements and when you assign a function to map, it applies that function independently to each one of the elements of the list. So if we have a square function, input is one element, output is that element squared, and we want to map the square function to a sequence of those five elements, the output is going to be each one of those elements squared. One square one, two square two, four, three square nine, four square sixteen, five twenty-five. So that's the style of programming that you can implement when you actually use a functional programming language like Haskell, Lisp, Scala. The other function that serves a name with MapReduce is the reduce function. And the reduce function, what it does is basically combine all the elements of a list into a single one by applying a binary function. So the actual, f the actual operator is going to take each pair of elements and it's going to condense them into one. We need to have, obviously, some associative function so that the results are correct no matter how we apply this. If, for instance, we define the sum function, which is basically adding the first element with the second one, we can define, okay, we are missing here, reduce sum 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and what we are going to get as a result is 1 plus 2, 3, 3 plus 3, 6, 6 plus 4, 10, 10 plus 5, 15. Why come now and talking of those strange functional languages that have nothing to do actually with what you are seeing here? Well, the reason why those uh, functional programming languages have kind of come back to popularity and they are heap languages these days is, among other things, that they are actually trivial to parallelize in many cases. Because this map function that you can see here, we can actually execute it independently for each one of the elements of my list. I can take five processors and one can do one square, the other one two square, three, four, five square. And similarly with the reduce. I can take one processor, reducing the first two elements, another reducing the final two. And then in another step, one takes those two results, one takes the other ones. So, functional programming languages, and in particular those two types of functions, give us a hint and a way in how we can actually parallelize many operations in an implicit way. And if you actually look here, what we are doing with this map code and with this reduce code, we are essentially defining a function. This is the, each one of the elements that we have in our list, and for each one of the elements of our list, we are running the same task. If we, we now go back to this input, you can kind of see that 
this input data can also be viewed as a collection. In this case, if my input is a corpus of text, we can definitely split that text into lines and then the whole data set, doesn't matter if it's 10 terabytes large, it is a massive list of elements. And what MapReduce does is for each one of those elements, it will actually apply this map function to each of them. Then we get those intermediate results and something kind of similar happens here. All the partial results will be grouped together into a collection of values and then this reduce operator can also take place here. It will take all that list of elements and it will compute and get a result from those. So that's kind of the history on how this actual system came to be and what it is trying to do in a slightly high level way. How are we doing up to now? Any question, anything that might be a bit strange? Don't? Yeah? So how do you decide if the reduce function should, should be this binary thing uh, and like a tree or if it should be on everything? Um, yeah. Is that up to the user to program or is it something uh, that's In the case of MapReduce, MapReduce does not really implement uh, exact reduce function. It is inspired in the same idea that you take all the elements of a list together to do something, but with MapReduce you can write whatever you want here. So if you have here a set of partial counts, you will only get one result because it makes sense to sum them together. But you could have an actual function that generates many results in MapReduce. So that is kind of open. What it does in the case of MapReduce is that it is going to run many different reduce functions because for each word that you have in your data set, each word has a different partial count and then those can also be parallelized here. Yep? Uh, this reduce function is not yet active, so we lose information on this stage. Uh, how to deal with it? And yes, how to assign how much elements will take this function to? Uh, so we are not losing information. Everything that what happens here, we will see Spark, which is slightly different. But basically, everything that is generated from the mappers is grouped together depending on the key, the word in this case, and each one of those word list of partial values will be executed by a different reducer. And each one of them runs independently. Okay. Well, so that's, let's say, the developer view of what people could be dealing with if they are using MapReduce. But if we want to go a bit deeper into what's going on here when we are really using MapReduce, this is really a system that is composed of three different parts. We have a data processing language, which is the only minimum thing we need to learn. What does map mean? What does reduce mean? That's every, the min, bare minimum we need to understand. But there are other two very important elements that are actually running all the time when we use one of those clusters. One of them is an actual data distribution platform that is running in our same cluster. Um, that is actually another innovation that Google presented a few years before. And for that, you kind of need to think of the main practicalities and how to actually implement this job. Imagine that you have a data set of 10, 500 terabytes of information that won't really fit into a single machine. And what I want to do is to basically split that data set and load it upon the different machines that are going to be executing my map function. Well, what Google thought, and this was a much earlier publication in 2003 is 
it actually makes sense that as we are going to have all those machines anyway processing data, we can also use them as a distributed repository, as a distributed file system. And that's what the Google file system in its paper proposed. In the case of the open source implementation, the Hadoop distributed file system did. Basically to take all the different machines that you have in your cluster and use them as storage nodes for the information that you are going to process in your big data system. That means that whenever I'm going to run a job request in Hadoop, I want to run this MapReduce job on this input file, before I run that job all the information is already copied and distributed across all the nodes that I have on my system. And in order to be safe, because I can be using 1000 different nodes and the more elements I use, the more likely it is that either of them will fail, all the information that I have here is going to be replicated. So if I am storing 64 megs of data here, this is also replicated in this other node, it's also replicated on this other node. And whenever I want to run a MapReduce job, what MapReduce will generally do is it already knows actually what elements uh, need to be processed. They are going to be registered in some general index element. And what it's going to do is to select processing nodes where the data is already there. Which means that I don't have to spend the first minutes or possibly hours of my system making sure that each one of my different machines has the required data they need to process. Rather than doing that, the data is already there on this distributed file system and then each one of those mapper nodes will basically be processing data that was already stored in its own file system. So that's one of the two elements that makes all of this work relatively okay. Similarly here in the reducers, each one of the reducers will write the result to its local disk and as information is replicated it will be automatically spread to other different nodes. But copying data uh, to your own disk, that is something that can be done in parallel again. So there will be no delay, no waiting for all the nodes saved into the same database. So that's the second of the three elements that really made the system work relatively well. Both the input and the output of our jobs it is actually stored in the same machines that are running the computation. And the other part that bears with most of the complexity of what's going on there is the actual system that takes my map function and my reduce function and makes sure that there is a coordination and all the required nodes are scheduled to take that job and they are triggered in the right order. And well, I could be spending a lot of time talking about everything that happens there. Luckily you don't need to worry about that if you are just going to be using the system. But just to at least show you one hint of what's happening whenever you run a job, basically you have some central, uh, I would say some master elements that receive the job requests and they basically do, do plenty of things. They decide how many nodes are needed in order to execute this specific job. Basically the bigger my data is, the more nodes I need. That's the standard way of sizing how, much, uh, how many nodes I need. Then I need to decide which nodes because as you will see this afternoon, this afternoon all of you are going to be sharing the same cluster. That means that the master element needs to allocate to each of you nodes that are actually free. It doesn't matter if I have 100 nodes because if all of you are allocated to the same three nodes, 
possibly only the first one will manage to run the job. So we need to do resource management to figure out which nodes will be used for each one of you. And then it needs to be actually watching that everything takes place. That first map tasks are running all the way to the end, all the information is moved from mappers to reducers, all the reducers run and all the information is finally sent to the end. So this is a quite a complete list of tasks that are being done transparently for you whenever you use one of those systems. And that's really the main reason why so many people have kind of jumped to yes, those big data systems are great, we want to use everything in a big data setting because it does not look that what we are doing is substantially more complex than writing our own programs but at the same time we have all those backend systems that are doing most of the job for us. How good of a job they do? Well, we cannot know but we kind of get that for free if we use map reviews so it can be convenient especially when we don't really understand what we are doing. So. Okay, so we are almost getting to the breaks. You have been very, very, a very, very good audience. I see all wide open eyes, so well done for that. The uh, only thing I want to do to wrap up this introduction to how these big data systems look like is to talk a tiny bit and kind of do some type of critique to I've told you this is great, if you don't care about what's going on, I'm going to speak a bit more about what's going on. And in order to, again, give you a bit more context in where Google, wh where Google came from in order to propose these kind of systems, there is a book I actually really recommend if any of you have any interest on big complex systems, how Google does things, which is a, it's a free book and it's called The Data Center as a Computer. It's uh, written by two Google engineers, Luis Barroso and I don't remember the other name, sorry for him. And to me it was really a change and really perspective changing book because it made me understand actually how different things are where you need to solve problems at the scale that Google does. And at that scale basically you can no longer think of individual machines. You need to think of whole servers with tens of thousands of machines as the computer you are using for running your search service, your recommendations engine, your advertising service. And one of the simple but I find kind of nice diagrams that they have in that book is a visual display of what a data center looks like. Well, a, a data center, in case you are not familiar with the term, is basically a building, a warehouse <coughs> full of <coughs> racks of machines with tens of thousands of servers, all of them interconnected there. And what Google kind of shows is if you look at a single machine, this is a machine with four processors, the figures are a bit old, but four processors, some caches, some RAM, share from all of them, you might have maybe 16 gig in total to play with. And you can get very fast to it. Access times are in a few nanoseconds, bandwidth is really good, you have gigabytes per second. If you want to read from disk, from your persistent storage, you have much more space, but it is way slower, it's a few orders of magnitude slower, you go down to megabytes. What can you do in order to scale up? Well, you can take a full rack of servers. All of them are interconnected with a switch, and if you look at all those elements together, you have substantially more RAM. We go from 16 to 1 terabyte of RAM. But of course, now we are no longer going at the same speed of my local bus. 
I need to go through my switch and that means I have been downgraded to 100 megs per second rather than gigabytes per second. So whenever I transfer information from one processor to another one, I will have to wait a bit. But I have many more resources. And of course, if I look at the whole data center, I will have even more resources, but in general my network is going to be slower. So all my computation will likely have to wait because of that. I am more powerful, but I am also much less efficient. And this is the classical trade-off of distributed systems. Which basically means that the culprit for all the issues, not all, but the, large, the vast majority of performance issues that we are going to find when we use a big data system comes because of the networking side of it. In, I am not talking today about graphs, but most graph computations, they tend to have complex synchronization patterns, which basically means that we need to send lots of messages. And when many people run performance tests to see how long it takes to compute some graph algorithm on a cluster, it's relatively easy that 80 to 90% of the time is spent just waiting for information to be sent across the network. So it is going to work, but those systems are not guaranteed you that they are going to work fast. In general, if you can express the same problem because it fits well enough into the single RAM machine of a GPU and you have some algorithms that work there, it has to be way faster on a GPU than on a big data cluster. Just because of the restrictions that you have on the access speed inside a computer versus the speed that you get across a network. And network speeds have improved a lot. Now, these days, there are lots of optical cables that actually are getting to gigabyte, gigabits per second. 40 gigabit Ethernet, I think, is the latest standard. So that is getting much better. But keep in mind that whenever there is some communication taking place in any big data system, that is likely to be one of the bottlenecks of your system. So to wrap up then this first hour of today, why did then MapReduce become this really cool, really hot thing that everyone has? Well, the main good thing is that for a parallel programming abstraction, programming language, it is very high level. It allows us to ignore all the actual message passing that is actually taking place. We only need to understand how to write map and reduce functions. And everything else is going to actually happen automatically. Another very good thing is that once you kind of see what you are doing, it is really difficult to kill a MapReduce cluster. And I can tell that from experience because every year I teach uh, 110 students in a master's plus final year module here on big data processing and the MapReduce cluster tends to hold okay because the actual programming model is very restricted and then it is very difficult to manage to basically load too much information, too much stuff into a single machine. On the other hand, the Spark that we are going to see in the second hour is much more flexible. It is more powerful and that can be risky. And systematically, I see all the students wanting to jump to Spark whenever I teach them that. They are pissed after the lecture. Why didn't you start with this? Why did we waste time with MapReduce? And then after the first lab, all the programs are crashing because if with MapReduce, even if you don't know what you are doing, things should finish OK. Whereas in the case of Spark, it does look easier, but it is also easier for you to mess up and to just use too much memory of your system. And the other really good thing of MapReduce and all those big data systems 
especially when you compare it to a CUDA style approach, is that they do scale very nicely. You can add more and more machines and you can have a cluster with 1,000 machines, with 10,000 machines and exactly the same programs are going to work. So if we are, for instance, in a cloud computing world in which we can ask for resources on demand, it is relatively straightforward to have access to a MapReduce cluster. You just need to think how big my cluster should be and that can be provisioned in any, in Amazon, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. As long as you have the money, you can get the processing platform. Whereas you might not find a GPU card that is powerful enough for what you want. However, it is really not something that works for every type of algorithm. Again, MapReduce has one map function, all the results are grouped together, and then one reduce function. That's it. If you want to implement any type of iterative algorithm, like almost every machine learning technique that you can think of, what it happens in MapReduce is that you are loading from disk map group, reduce, save to disk. What do I do now? I start again. I load from disk, map, group, reduce, save to disk. And as a result of that, I spend most of the time reading and writing from my persistent storage, which is actually really slow. And I need to find some strange way to chain together all those map reduce jobs. So Technically, MapReduce is a Turing complete abstraction. You can write any program you want here and it is possible to do so, but it is not a good idea really. You could really say that this actual cycle is a kind of a low level programming abstraction and because of that other newer uh, big data frameworks like Spark that we will talk soon have kind of catch up and got most of the hype behind the big data because writing programs in MapReduce it is very formally correct but it is going to be a bit cumbersome and in many times quite much inefficient so I wanted anyway to use MapReduce now because there is nothing fundamentally different from Spark to what you have seen here, and I feel it's a bit more clear to actually explain how the systems look like. But for practical terms, we will use a slightly higher level language, as you will see later. All right, any question before we go to get some coffee? No, then let's take a break.